Welcome to another edition of our Musician Interlude. This week, we're very thrilled to be joined by a violinist that's a soloist, recitalist, and, and a favorite here in Seattle, a frequent guest at our festival, Karen Gomio. Uh, thank you so much for taking some time and, and chatting with us today. It's great to be here. Nice to see you. Yeah, it's great to see you. First, we always like to ask, you're staying healthy. You've been doing well during this pandemic. and you know, friends and family have all been doing pretty well, I hope. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I, yeah, just fingers crossed, but everybody around me so far has been healthy and well, and I hope the same for you. Yep, yep, we're doing doing great here in Seattle. Actually, yeah. I wanted to, to ask you about that because originally you weren't on the, the roster of musicians to join us, um, but you kind of got roped in doing uh, the Pekofi <laughs> of Sonata for Two Violins with Noah. How did that sort of come about? How did that project for you arise? Yeah, so I think, uh, so Noah was supposed to be there this summer. Um, and Noah and I live in the same neighborhood in Berlin and, you know, we're good friends. And um, I think, uh, well, you should probably ask him, but I think, I think he, uh, you know, realized he wasn't going to be able to travel all the way to, to Seattle. Um, and I think he got a request to, to send in a video of playing something solo. And, and I think he just didn't want to is how I understood. And so <laughs> he asked me, um, you know, would you be up for doing some duos uh, instead? And um, yeah, and I think, you know, James must have approved it. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I actually, um, they, they would know the background better, but, but this is how um, Noah presented it to me. So yeah. I was really happy to do it. Um, it was super fun because neither of us had any clue what we were doing with the, the tech side of things. And we didn't have anything close to professional, you know, recording mics or, or anything. Uh, so, so we really got creative and used, you know, yoga blocks, um, clothing pins. I mean, all kind like whatever you could find uh, in, in my room because we did it at my place. And um, yeah, for, for me, it, it ended up being a great memory. I mean, I'm so glad that we got to, you know, send some uh, a performance video to you guys um and uh hopefully you guys enjoyed it but you know i think for us we we just had so much fun doing it and it was just a really special thing to be able to to do and be a part of so you know I, yeah that's great <laughs> that's yeah great. we'd love to see the the behind the scenes footage of how it all came yeah. together then <laughs> it sounds like you know making your own <laughs> studio is was a, a chore or yeah, kind of absolutely, a fun. <laughs> absolutely. You know, putting chair on top of a table on top of a chair and you know <laughs> Exactly. I saw that, uh, you know, on your Instagram, I saw that you're, you recently performed down at the Fort Worth Symphony. Um, yes. Have you been doing very many other live performances? And, and what was that like um, to, to get to perform? Was it with a live audience? Or was it live streamed or, or on demand? Or how did that performance work? Yeah, so um... I've been joking to my friends that I've, I've basically had an October career <laughs> because the performances that I did do with an actual orchestra and with a live audience, they, they, both, they all happened in October. Um, prior to that, wow, it feels like a long time ago already thinking back, but um, I think the majority of what I did was for the microphone. Mm -hmm. And so um, a couple of weeks before Fort Worth, I went to Prague and I played with the Czech Philharmonic. Um, that was originally supposed to be three concerts, but they, um, you know, changed the repertoire. I mean, the, the usual, usual thing now that we hear so much of um, uh, doubled the number of concerts so that they could accommodate as you know the the original number of, of audience members uh, in, into the same day. So um, six concerts total, and then similarly in Fort Worth. Um, they increased the, the concerts to, to, to four from the original three. Um, and that was with a live audience. Actually, bo both these places were with a live audience. And I just remember, just because Prague came first, I remember walking onto that stage, which is beautiful, by the way, um, but also just really feeling like 
everything I was experiencing, sensing was, was new in a way because it had been so long and the context in which I was there was just so unique and unprecedented. Um, and I remember one of the first things the conductor, uh, Maestro Bichkov, said to me when we met prior to the rehearsal was, you know, the, the people that come to these concerts, they want the music so much, they really need it, you know, and that immediately made me feel like, yes, we're in this mission together to, this is really about bringing music together as musicians on stage and, and, and having the audience there was, was for us such a, um, uh, a counterpart that was necessary and that's been missing all this time, all these months. And it really brought to the surface this tremendous feeling of, wow, we are all in this together, where whether we're the ones holding the instruments or sitting in the audience, you know, giving us their, their, their uh, in the moment attention and this give and take is really what's been missing. And, and that's, that just simply cannot be replicated. I mean, it's great that we're talking like this, but, but it's a different thing. It's really different when you're in, when you're sharing an experience, when you're sharing a moment together in the same space. Um, and that's what an, a performance has always been. And it was just amazing to feel that, like almost like a, a you know, a splash of cold water in your face. Hmm. Like, oh, this, this is, is what, what it's, do. what it's all about. Yeah. Yeah, it's been what been a while. I, yeah, yeah. So I really loved um, that the conductor said that as one of the first things because I thought, great, we're you know we're on the, we're on the same page with with yeah. what this is about. You know, you are primarily a, a concert soloist, and I'm curious. You know, this is a time where so many orchestras have had to to cancel programs or change programs and switch things up. How is how has it been to cope? for you as, as we've gone through these past, I guess, nine months almost now? Yeah, it, it hasn't been easy. I think, you know, there's something about the way we've been living or, or the way I've become accustomed to, and my colleagues, you know, we've, be, we've become accustomed to having our, our lives scheduled, you know, planned out uh, every single detail, basically, you know, repertoire and, and dates and, and times and all that you know, two, two, one, two years in advance, sometimes even three. And, and now we're really in this sort of day-to-day -day existence of not really knowing what tomorrow is going to bring. And I realized in the preparation process of, of uh, practicing a, a piece and, and realizing just how much you put into preparing something, think you're, you're sort of all in, you know, you've got this all in attitude. And then at the very last minute, some, you know, they, they changed the repertoire and it's, it's really, um, I realized I wasn't used to that. I was just so used to, to just knowing, you know, what to be working for and just having this, this, yeah, as I said, all in attitude. And so, um, I mean, sure enough, uh, you know, with both of these orchestras that I played with in October, uh, they both ended up having to change the repertoire. Uh, Texas, they, they had prepared a little bit, uh, you know, further in advance, anticipating that uh, certain things were going to be an issue, like the number of people in the orchestra playing at, at the same time and all of that. And so um, it was actually, you know, both concerts were meant to be uh, Shostakovich Violin Concerto, which you can Big imagine <laughs> the orchestra doesn't get any yeah. bigger than that. And so Texas changed to Bernstein Serenade, which is basically for violin, strings uh, and percussion and, and harp. And, um, and Prague, <laughs> it, it was a little more last minute. So, you know, <laughs> in fact, I, I ran it through for Noah, you know, I, I said, hey, can I play it for you? And he um, basically around the same time was going to play uh, Bruch Concerto with the Berlin Phil. And so we, we both played our concertos for each other, you know, and we were all both in this, okay, we're ready, you know, state of mind. And then suddenly the orchestra oh. called and said, can't do Shostakovich anymore. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm leaving in a few days. Okay, Mozart. And, and yeah, it, you know, it's, it, it, it's an adjustment. It's really not something um, 
I'm used to, I realize. But this flexibility, I think, is also healthy for us to realize, you know, this, <laughs> I mean, on a larger scale, this is what life is, right? I mean, going with the flow is, is really important. And um, I think having that flexibility and, and actually being grateful for whatever comes your way, you know, and, and if, if having to adapt quickly is a part of it, well, so be it. I know that you moved to Berlin, you know, you said you live a couple blocks from Noah, um, a couple of years ago now, isn't it? Or almost two years? And almost four. Oh, wow. Much longer. God, time goes fast. <laughs> How yeah. have you noticed, you know, moving over to Europe and being in the heart of one of, you know, the most musical cities in the world, you know, how has that changed sort of your opportunities? Uh, I know right now, obviously, things are kind of up in the air, but what was that change like for you to, to kind of pick up and and start somewhere new again? Yeah, well, so I think um, I was always drawn to Europe. I always wanted to live in Europe, even as a younger student. And so that that was always lurking in the back of my mind. And about four years ago, a lot of things that, that was happening in um, in my life just sort of coincided in this moment where I felt, okay, if I'm going to do this, it's now or never. Um, and so I just decided to do it. And I chose Berlin because of the reasons you mentioned. Uh, I mean, it's, it's so rich culturally and you just have some amazing things going on here in the arts and music and, um, you know, one of the things about growing up, I mean, I grew up in Montreal, I spent many, many years in New York. Um, I realized both of those those cities are, are very multicultural. And um, I, I, I thought that Berlin would, would in a way, help me make, uh, make me feel at home because it's also a very, very um, multicultural city. And so it was surprising how very quickly I felt at home here indeed and um it's i i've i've loved being closer to certain colleagues that um that have always lived in europe and that i really enjoy playing with um and i love how um the countries are so close together you know when you when you compare it <laughs> when you compare the individual countries in europe with the size of the united states for example or, or canada where i'm from and um, and that proximity to me just was very exciting to be able to even, even drive to neighboring countries and be immediately exposed to a very, very different culture. Um, and so I've really enjoyed that aspect a lot. That's great. Yeah, that's terrific. Um, I'm curious, you said, you know, before, before we started, we were just kind of chatting that, you know, during this pandemic, you've done quite a bit of, you know, audio recording and some different projects you were you were talking about one where you were inspired by some paintings um can you talk about about that project a little bit yeah so this was back in i guess towards the beginning like march april where you know i think we we all had very individual reactions to this news that was going starting to go around the world that we'd be locked down and so on um, and for me, it was definitely a really paralyzing time, um, the uncertainty, and also my mother lives in Vancouver, and I'm in Berlin, and the, the lack of easy, you know, access to her, she's my only family right now, and so um, that was very difficult, that was very difficult, and it was generally a time of, of, of reflection, and um, I was reflecting on, on, on her a lot, you know, just worried about her. And um, my mother's a visual artist, but I think that in my life so far, I had always seen her primarily as a mother. Um, I, I hadn't, I think, I mean, I, I've, I've always appreciated her as an artist, but I think it's really because of the time and space I've had in the beginning of the pandemic that I really, you know, I started look, looking at her work and I thought, wow, this is, this is really amazing stuff, you know, and to, and to sort of remove the, the motherness behind the artist and, and just look at her as an artist and realize that throughout her career as an artist, um, you know, she's been through a really unique path. Um, and reflecting on, on these things, um, I felt really compelled and inspired to 
make make a video combining her work and mine um and from my last album which is generally very 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 happy it's it's all um italian music for violin and, and guitar there there is one piece in there surprisingly by paganini um <laughs> Uh, but, but actually, you know, j just as a side note, but part of this disc was I wanted to highlight Paganini's tender side that people don't often think of because people think of Paganini as this flashy virtuoso, fiery, you know, the devil. <laughs> but um, he has very much a tender, vulnerable side that is reflected much more in his violin and guitar music. And so there is one sonata in particular, simply called Sonata in A, but... Um, the, the first movement is this beautiful lyrical piece. And I just felt like it represented something that I was feeling while flipping the pages, looking at this picture album of my mom's paintings. Um, something to do with reflection, something to do with hope, something to do with, you know, j j just a mood, a, a mood um, that's difficult to capture, but therefore I thought it would be fun to put it together uh, with her paintings and in a way to, to, to showcase her paintings, but very much working also on, you know, where I thought like the transition of between the phrase, phrase, phrases would match the changing of the paintings. And oh, nice. for me, yeah. it was also um, my first iMovie project. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was a fun thing to do, you know. Um, and it was also my way of telling my mother how much I, I appreciate her as an artist. And so, yeah. That's nice. It, you know, it connects you, uh, like you say, even though you're half a world apart, you know, it brings what you're both doing together in a way that's, that's lovely. Yeah. I'm curious too, during this time, you know, so many of us have been stuck at home or not been able to travel like you're so used to where, you know, you're off to another country or city to play every weekend. Uh, have there been any new hobbies or are there books on the bookshelf you were trying to get to that you found time for or, or what's kind of filled some of the time that you've had while you have been at home? Main thing I would say is German language lessons. No, oh, excellent. <laughs> Important while you live in Berlin. Yeah, well, you know, and this is the thing, I, I've been here nearly four years, um, but I've never really been here. I, like you said, I, I was traveling so much that, um, and also I live in a neighborhood where there are a lot of foreigners, um, mm -hmm. you, you can get by speaking English, but I never felt comfortable living in Germany and not speaking, speaking the language. Um, and so I finally decided this is the time, you know, to do it. And so, um, in the beginning, I actually did a super intensive four days a week course. Yeah. yeah. Three hours of, of lessons every day and you just feel so tired. And then, <laughs> yeah. that and, you know, so I did that. Um, and then I thought, okay, well, as it's great that I'm doing this, but I realized it was taking up so much of my energy um, that now I've reduced it down to twice a week. So I still have two classes a week but it keeps me going, you know, and, um, and I'm still, and now I, I, I feel like I have a little more headspace for, you know, other things, but it's been really great to have this opportunity to delve into the language, um, uh, the way I did in the beginning anyway, with the super intensive, uh, you know, schedule. So. Nice. Yeah. It's a, it's great to, you know, find some new things and expand. So hopefully the, the German you're, you're feeling much more confident and getting around, navigating around. <laughs> oh, it's such a difficult language. I, I don't, <laughs> I'm still in level A2 or something. So yeah, you know, there's A1.1, A1.2, and then A2.1, A2.2. And apparently when you get to B1, you finally get a sense of, of the flow of the language. And one of my teachers told me, uh, you know, I said to her, so does that mean we're, we're, we're doomed until then or do it, you know, or do just don't know what's going on until then. And she said, probably, but just, just hang in there, just keep going. And you'll see when you reach B level, you'll see it'll be, you know, you'll suddenly have an aha moment. So I'm well, that'll be good there. motivation, right? Keep you going. <laughs> I'm curious. So you are actually going to be here in Seattle for our, our online winter festival um, this January that will be uh, broadcast and on demand through February and then into March. 
Um, can you talk a little bit about what you'll be playing with us and you know some of the music that we'll we'll get to hear while you are here with us in Seattle? So um, I'll be playing uh, in two Mozart uh, groups. So one is a string quartet, the other one is a, a string quintet. And, um, and then the third piece will be, it's no longer a world premiere, but it will be, I believe, an American premiere. Uh, it's a work written by my, my friend and amazing composer, Samuel Adams. Um, it's called Diptych, and it's a piece for violin, piano, and electronics. And this is a piece that he wrote back in March, I believe, March, April, so, you know, shortly after the pandemic started. Um, and uh, it's really, it's something that, that, that was born very, very sort of organically for him. You know, he had a, a number of, of friends that, that were sort of, you know, asking him, are you going to write something? Uh, you know, I was one of them. I was, I was asking him, have you written for solo violin, you know, or violin and piano? And yeah, well, I'll think about it. And, you know, so I think a culmination of all these different conversations he's, he had, and, and it was, it was music that was really born out of friendship and, and not, it was not a commission, you know? And so I think that in itself, um, uh, it puts, puts this piece apart because it, it really, um it's a piece of music that that first of all i've i've really i really really love um you know aside from the fact that that sam is a friend objectively it's really music that 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 spoke to me immediately when i heard it because initially his um his wife had made a a recording a private recording of it and i thought wow this is just so so special and it captures a lot of this yearning for well, in my view, <laughs> um, yearning for freedom, yearning for there's a there's a timelessness in the music. Um, I don't want to describe it too much, but I think the the general feeling is yeah, the yearning for freedom that he captures so well. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I just I'm really really excited to bring this to the to the festival, um, and I'm so thankful that that you guys agreed to program it because I think it's going to be really special. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm super curious how people will, will react to it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's always fun to come to Seattle and I never ask James who, who's coming my week because, you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, we're, we're like a big family and I think we all like each other, whoever's going to be there. And this was the same this time, you know, he, he said, which week works better for you i said a second week great and then eventually I, I got a list of you know what what was going to be played as well as who's who's coming and i'm just so so excited to see everybody that's going to be there that week yeah. um like it's been forever and um especially i think making playing chamber music right now is going to feel so so special i think yeah. uh one other question i had so in the, the two pieces by Mozart. So in one of them, you'll be the first violin, the second, uh, you're gonna be the second violinist. Um, does that change how you approach a piece or how you prepare it? Or once you're here in Seattle and, and the rehearsals start? I, I often enjoy playing second violin more than the first violin part because it's a, it's a, it's a role I don't usually get to experience when I'm playing solo, you know, with an orchestra whatnot and um it's really fun to be part of the inner voice um i've also played viola in groups before mm -hmm. you know and, and that that is such a special and fun role role to be in and just to, to to experience the same piece from a different seat basically you know from a different voice mm -hmm. um is is really it's it's such a such an enjoyable thing um and i think when you have all these individually really interesting musicians come together that can be super fun that's fantastic well we can't can't wait to have you here in january and and get to hear uh, both those pieces by mozart but also the the u.s premiere of the the adams work that'll be a lot of fun thank you for sharing that with us i'm glad it's on the the schedule and thank you again so much for for spending some time and chatting with us today karen thank you